Yeah, like Londa said, I'm going to go over just the basics of post-harvest handling of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of the things that helps maintain the quality and the shelf life of produce goes hand in hand with maintaining the safety as well. So a lot of the same practices that Cal mentioned, I'll kind of go over again too. My hope is just to provide some of the science of post-harvest physiology that kind of helps you think through of how to properly handle vegetables on a vegetable by vegetable basis. Go over a quick outline. Um, so what post-harvest means and why is it important? Talk about first, and then we'll just go through some methods of ways to reduce post-harvest losses. And then I'll finish off with some just handling tips of harvest and packaging and storage and transportation. So what is post-harvest handling? It's a pretty obvious uh, definition, means after harvest. But it's really important to um, remember that both the pre-harvest conditions and the harvest harvesting itself um, has to do a lot with the quality. The quality is determined during growth and it's not gonna improve after harvest. So really the whole goal of post-harvest handling is to really slow the degradation of the crop. Um, you wanna harvest it at the proper maturity to ensure a high quality product. So, we usually do this as a little activity in the room, but we'll just do it silently. Um, are fruits and vegetables alive after harvest? Yes, they are. Um, since fruits and vegetables are alive, um, that means that they continue all of their biological and biochemical processes that they were doing when they were still attached to the plant. So they're still gonna breathe um, and pr produce heat, lose moisture and shrivel, and that means that they can also die. So like I said, our goal is to just make that process as long as possible so the shelf life is extended. So just thinking about some of the characteristics of perishable commodities, um, we know that they're living tissues. Um, they're all, really all fruits and vegetables are very high in water content, so we're really concerned with water loss as a quality concern. Um, subject to pathological breakdown, um, either foodborne pathogens or not, they could be subject to breakdown. Um, but they're all really diverse in terms of their morphological structure. So like what part of the plant it is, a fruit or a vegetable. The composition is gonna be different between leafy greens and a peach. The general physiology is very different. So kind of knowing what plant organ or developmental stage your fruit or vegetable is can kind of help you determine what the best post-harvest handling would be. So we usually do this little game of name the part, the plant part. So if you guys want to just take a second and maybe think of them all in your heads and then I can reveal the answers. So some of them are pretty obvious. Um, onions are usually the ones that trick people up a little bit. Onions are actually modified leaves. Lettuce is of course leaves as well. Broccoli is the stalk and the immature flower of the plant. Peach is the fruit and peas are the seeds. I'm sure most people um, know. But just knowing kind of what you're dealing with first can kind of help you um, understanding how to treat the product. So what factors influence post-harvest losses? I'll kind of go through the internal factors that influence post-harvest loss and shelf life, and then kind of how we can manipulate our environment to, to um, optimize these internal factors that are occurring in the plant. So we know that fresh commodities are still alive. Um, so that means they're still um, undergoing chemical reactions and it's generally referred to that all these, the sum of these chemical reactions happening in the plant or the commodity is called its metabolism. And respiration is one of these key reactions that's still happening. Um, it is when cells use oxygen to break down the carbohydrates or sugar to produce CO2 and energy. And that energy is kind of helps supplying all the other reactions and chemical reactions still happening in that product. Um, but one important thing to know here is that this um, respiration produces heat as a byproduct, and that's why we are mostly concerned with it. That's gonna heat the commodity up, and um, that's what we want to prevent in post-harvest handling. We don't want it to become warm. The higher the respiration rate, the more heat they will produce, and that will diminish the shelf life. So this is just um, classifying fruits and veggies based on whether or not they respire at really high rates or really low rates. This is very temperature dependent, but some commodities just 
don't have as high respiration rates. And this is really intuitive for what you think about as having a longer shelf life. So your tree fruits and potatoes have really low respiration rates, but our leafy greens and our broccoli and sweet corn has really high respiration rates. And that coincides pretty nicely with its general shelf life. Um, and then this little graph is just showing you that the higher the temperature it's stored at, so we have um, 32 to 70, it's going to produce a lot more heat via respiration if it's stored at a higher temperature. Um, so temperature is the most important factor in anything post-harvest. Really all it comes down to is just maintaining the best temperature for that commodity to extend the shelf life and to maintain quality and to limit any sort of foodborne issues. Because um, temperature dictates the speed of those chemical reactions, including respiration. So typically for every 18 degrees increase in respiration, every 18 degrees increase in temperature results in a two to four fold increase in respiration. And kind of the reverse of that is for every 10 degrees decrease in temperature, you can kind of extend your shelf life by two to three fold. Uh, here's a good visualization of that. This is just broccoli stored for a couple of days at either 75 Fahrenheit or 40. And you could definitely see the quality concerns there at that 75. So ways to cool down the produce. Um, it's really important to get the field heat off as soon as possible. Um, there's a number of ways to do that. Most commonly would probably be air cooling, uh, which would just be placing the bin in a cool room. Another method is forced air. That requires pretty large refrigeration capacity and it's usually larger scale ag. Um, Hydrocooling is a very efficient way of cooling faster than just air temperature, but kind of like what Cal was saying and Londo was saying, that's also introducing a water source. So if you're not already washing that commodity um, with sanitizer or not, probably not recommending to hydrocool. Um, a pass over with that cool water is a good method to get some of that field heat off without actually having to dunk it. Um, and hydrocooling really isn't suitable for a lot of delicate fruits and veggies. Um, ice cooling is a method. Top icing is commonly used in like large scale broccoli um, production. And then vacuum cooling is a very efficient method where um, an airtight room chamber is sealed and all the air is removed with a vacuum pump. It's also usually pretty large scale. And it looks like me and Cal had the same little factoid here that strawberries, one hour at field temperature, even anything above 32 C equals one week at zero C or 32 Fahrenheit. So then once you have that field heat off, um, it's really important to maintain the cold chain. So any breaks in this chain, um, like transporting it to market or when it's out on the table at the market, um, that will result in the commodity wanting to heat back up because it's going to start respiring more um, and it will be exposed to hotter air temperatures. So maintaining that as best as you can and exposing it to higher temperatures for very limited times will be really key in extending the shelf life and quality of the product. This is a cool bot system if anybody is not familiar. It's this little um, device that hooks into a just a window air conditioning unit and it kind of tricks the air conditioning unit to just be on all the time. You can put it in an insulated room. It's a low cost method to have a large um, refrigerated space. We could talk a little bit more about that if anybody has any questions afterwards. Um, so I'll kind of transition into water loss. Um, this is a huge quality concern because it can be a direct loss of money because of the, the weight is decreasing considerably since most of the weight is water in a fruit or vegetable. Um, it's also just an important source of quality loss. So even if you can't physically see it wilting or shriveling, it could have some quality concerns like textural quality, um, something losing its crispness or juiciness. And then there's also the fact that some vitamins are water soluble. So if the water is leaving, then like vitamins A and C will also be diminished in that product. And there's a relatively small margin of water loss that can occur that um, makes a product unmarketable. Um, this is mostly a concern for leafy greens. 
Um, if you think about something that has a large surface to volume ratio, um, it'll have lower amounts of water loss will result in it being more unmarketable, which is pretty intuitive. We know that asparagus loses water pretty quickly and become pretty lignified like this, um, spinach wilting. So methods of preventing water loss. Um, it's important to control relative humidity in your cold storage room or refrigerator even. Um, the best method would be to have a higher relative humidity, but in a low temperature room. You don't want a high humidity, high heat situation. That would be um, not great and attract those foodborne pathogens. Um, but you and also don't want any puddles of water. So if you're raising the humidity in a cold storage room by spraying, you just don't want any puddling or too much condensation to occur because that can be that microbial risk. Um, and avoiding kind of condensation can help. You don't want a lot of temperature fluctuations because that will result in condensation and then drying out of the product over and over and that can produce like increased water loss of fruits and veggies. So avoid like opening and closing the door a lot can kind of help maintain a solid low temperature and high humidity, reducing airflow, and just using protective packaging. Plastic films can go a long way in extending the shelf life and reducing water loss. Here are just some examples. Um, like I mentioned, leafy greens would be the most susceptible that you would probably think of wanting to have some sort of protective barrier. Also, if something is already cut, it'll, reduce, it'll lose water much more quickly. So this example has some um, squash covered too. Uh, here's an easy way to just line a box and then you have that um, whole thing covered up. So I'll transition into physiological disorders. Um, these are any kind of fruit disorder that you see on the product, tissue damage or breakdown, but it's not anything related to pathogens or insects or mechanical damage, although a lot of the times it can look that way. Um, Physiological disorders can be caused by a number of environmental factors. Um, the most important ones would be extreme temperatures, altered atmosphere, gas concentrations, and nutritional deficiencies. Um, so very high temperatures can cause changes to the fruit or vegetable membranes and kind of result in some pitting or soft spots. Freezing temperatures can do this as well because ice crystals can form, which can cause physical damage to the cells and membranes of the commodity. And then chilling injury is when temperatures don't go below freezing, but the commodity is chilling sensitive. So this would be mostly like subtropical or tropical fruits and veggies, um, like a tomato. So in response to just under 55 degrees even, they, they can result in quite a few different symptoms on the, on the products. And I have a picture to show you in the next slide. Um, but other physiological disorders can happen from the atmosphere gas concentrations changing. Um, this could be like a low O2 and a high CO2 environment that can happen sometimes just naturally in storage. So this picture is an example of um, black heart and potato, which just means that not enough oxygen was able to diffuse in and not enough CO2 was able to diffuse out of that product, which could have just been from um, being in the wrong temperature storage or being stacked really densely and just not enough airflow getting to the middle of those potatoes. And then the last kind of physiological disorder can occur from nutrition. And this is more of a pre-harvest factor based on the nutrition during the growing season. Um, example that most people know is blossom end rot of tomato um, because of calcium deficiency during the season. And here is some examples of chilling injury on some beans and an eggplant. These are both chilling sensitive. They're warm season crops. They don't like cold temperatures and they want to be stored at like 55 degrees. And so this can result in some pitting or just brown marks that are often pretty hard to like identify what's going on. You might think it's pathological, but it could just be from storing it too cold. And sometimes the um, symptoms don't appear in the refrigeration, then you take them out of refrigeration and back to room temp or 55 degrees, and then those will appear. I heard something. Did anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead and ask questions if you have a question. I, yes, um, please interrupt. 
or write in the chat too and I can answer whatever. We'll move on. So chilling injury of tomatoes, a failure to ripen or sometimes like blotchy ripening of a tomato can be a result of chilling injury. Um, maturity plays a big role in how chilling and sensitive it can be too and just tomatoes itself depending if they are green or like at the breaker stage or if they are red ripe tomatoes, they have different chilling thresholds. So an actual ripe red tomato can be stored down to 45 degrees, but that temperature would damage a green tomato and it has to do with like the sugar content of the fruit kind of protecting it. But that's just an important thing to keep in mind if you, um, depending on what stage you're harvesting the tomatoes can depend on what storing temperature you should use. This is just a good um, reference little sheet for the proper storage temperatures for vegetables. Um, it tends to be that like, if you think of your cool season crops and leafy greens and your brassicas, they'll all wanna be stored at 32 to 36. Um, lots of root veggies are that temperature too, like carrots and beets. And then if you think of more of your warm season, solanaceous and your cukes, those will be a little bit higher of storage temperature requirements, 40 to 50. And then potatoes, um, hard squashes, tomatoes, onions will be um, meant to be stored between 55 and 65. That's after curing of potatoes and squash too. Okay, switch gears a little bit and talk about ethylene. I promise it won't be too much of a chemistry lesson here. Um, but ethylene is just a gaseous hormone that is produced and synthesized by all plants throughout many different stages of the plant life cycle and of fruits and vegetables. Um, there's different ethylene production patterns amongst different commodities. Um, these are called climacteric or non-climacteric, which I'll kind of get into in the next slide. Um, but some products after they're harvested can be very sensitive to a high ethylene environment and some are not. Some products also produce high amounts of ethylene and some don't produce ethylene. Um, but ethylene can be pretty um, achieved or slowed pretty easily by just lowering the temperature. Like everything else, maintain your cold temperature. And this kind of just shows different ethylene production by different commodities. Um, like leafy greens, um, root veggies don't produce that much ethylene. Lots of tree fruits tend to produce high amounts of ethylene. So if you tend to think of things that, I'll go back ripen after you harvest it, they'll produce a little bit, they'll produce more ethylene in storage than something that doesn't ripen after you harvest it. So talking about these climacteric and non-climacteric, so that's typically how they're classified. So if you harvest something and it can continue to ripen, like an apple or tomato, that's climacteric. If it's non-climacteric, it means the quality is determined right at harvest and you need to harvest it at that optimal eating quality. Um, they don't have this ethylene production peak that helps it ripen post-harvest. So a little practical application of that is harvesting climacteric crops like a tomato on the onset of ripening, so at this A stage before it starts to turn red. If you harvest it and then um, have it in storage, you can actually kind of block ethylene for a little bit until you want it to ripen. That's by just um, storing it at the proper temperature around 55 degrees. And then it'll continue to ripen and, and um, have that peak in ethylene and ripen itself. So it's just kind of a, um, um, a way to manipulate that kind of crop. I can't see the chat boxes on my screen. So sorry if anybody had any chats. So here's just classification of climacteric and non-climacteric crops. Um, Again, those are the ones that harpen, ripen after you harvest them, like apples, apricots, blueberries, peaches, plums. Um, blueberries are a weird exception though. They will ripen, but they will not improve in flavor. So it's necessary to harvest those at um, optimal eating quality. And then all the non-climacteric crops would be harvested at optimal eating quality as well. Um, so if the crop is being stored and there happens to be a kind of accumulation of ethylene in storage, it can result in some symptoms on certain veggies. and leafy greens and brassicas, it usually results in just this yellowing effect. 
Um, there's some root veggies that can be sensitive. Fruits tend to produce a lot of ethylene. And then flowers are very, very sensitive to ethylene. You're never gonna wanna store tomatoes near any cut flowers. The leaves in the flowers will just all fall off. Um, but some ways to manage that, again, rapid and efficient cooling and proper storage helps prevent ethylene damage. Um, combustion engines also produce ethylene as a byproduct. It's a common symptom in greenhouses that have heaters with combustion engines. Um, that can have some effect on products. So just making sure there's nothing like that near where you're storing produce and just periodically venting the storage area. Um, say you have like a plastic line thing of beans, you just want to vent that bag every so often to prevent any accumulation inside the bag. Um, then most obvious kind of damage to post-harvest is physical damage. And it actually probably causes the greatest amount of loss to fresh horticultural products. Um, it enhances the water loss, increases respiration and ethylene production. That's just like a natural response to the stress of being damaged. Um, it'll also be a good place for pathogens and foodborne illnesses to get in and grow inside of the veggie and can lead to tissue discoloration. It'll just make it uh, more unmarketable. This is probably not a practice you want to do. Throw a melon six feet in the air. Can cause internal bruising. And then I won't to talk too much about pathological decay. Um, Cal talked a lot about the foodborne illness side of things, but really all the same practices of storing and cold storage and being really clean in your practices helps prevent any pathological decay. So now I will transition into some handling tips, starting at harvest. Picking early in the morning um, helps kind of reduce the field heat that's already on the product, so it'll take less energy to reduce to remove that field heat. Um, harvesting at the proper maturity can help you help achieve the best quality post-harvest. Being gentle and sanitary in your picking practices. Always use clean totes and buckets and totes and buckets that can be clean not wood, it's not recommended. Um, don't overfill the totes in the buckets because that can lead to some compression and bruising. Always use sharp tools and clean tools. If you kind of have a jagged cut to harvest something that can actually cause stress to the crop and it'll respire more and that can heat up the product more. Um, discard any damaged produce or just don't store it near the good produce because that damaged produce, again, be more stressed, it'll be respiring more, producing a lot of heat. Um, pick clean crops. Always put your harvest buckets in the shade and try to get them out of the field as soon as possible. Um, transportation from the field to wherever you're going to store it. It'd be a good idea to um, allow airflow between containers. Using harvest buckets that have those holes is a good idea. Um, you want to cool it down as soon as possible and maintain that cold chain. Um, like parking a vehicle in a shaded area would be a simple way to when you're accumulating products in the field. This is an example of the, we call it the Cool Cat at the Olathe Horticulture Center. And that is just a trailer that has one of those cool bot systems and a AC unit inside. So you just, as soon as we harvest, we just throw it right into the cool bot and that can be driven from the field to its destination. So during cleaning and sorting, um, removing unmarketable produce as soon as possible is a good idea so it's not intermingled with the marketable. Um, using clean and sanitary surfaces, always clean. Um, anything you're gonna be spraying the produce down with, clean those surfaces. Washing can be combined with cooling. Um, like I mentioned, if you're already gonna do a wash step, keeping that water really cool can kind of combine two things in one. Um, and use appropriate cleaning methods. Like Cal and Londa said, not all commodities should be washed, um, not just for the commodity itself, but just for food safety. Um, package and storage, using appropriate materials, um, mostly meaning something that's cleanable or that's not gonna be used over and over. Pack produce in the same maturity stage. You don't want to like intermingle your green tomatoes with your red tomatoes. The red tomatoes will um, 
will ripen the green tomatoes maybe earlier than you want them to ripen. Don't overpack or um, store an optimum temperature and humidity. So what's really ideal since all these commodities have different um, refrigeration requirements is having two cooling rooms, one at that 32 to 36 range and another area at a 50 to 57. Um, if that's not possible, having one cool room or a large fridge at 41 and then having a room with um, good AC for those chili and sensitive crops like a tomato could be another good option for small growers. And then packaging and storing um, one lot, just I'm sure many of people know this, potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, they store longer if you do this curing step. So that's just um, holding the produce at a high temperature and high relative humidity for several days while harvesting wounds kind of heal and then that new protective layer of cells can form and then that will um, result in a lot longer shelf life and longer time that you can sell the product than if it wasn't cured. And this accounts, this is also can be used for like hard winter squash. All right, so last slide, keys to success in post-harvest handling of fruits and veggies. So remember that the highest initial quality is determined at harvest, so harvest at the proper maturity. Um, careful handling to minimize physical damage is important. Management of environmental conditions, mainly temperature is the most important thing you can possibly do to extend the shelf life and maintain quality and safety. Um, thinking about relative humidity and controlling for that. Remembering the atmospheric composition um, and the ethylene effects and keeping a well ventilated area can help with those and just using really proper sanitation procedures that Cal kind of already went over. And there are a lot of good resources out there that have um, post harvest handling toolkit type things for small growers. I can give the slide to Londa to make it available so you guys can access those resources as well. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Let me know if anybody has any questions.